Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. And so, O oh Lord, we say, O oh, the blessedness of the one whose transgression is forgiven. And we come into your presence together this morning, Lord, as those who name the name of Jesus, your Son, and so who know the joy of sins forgiven, who know what it means to be at peace with God, who know the joy of heavens opened forever. We come as those whom you dare to call your own, your own people, your own children, through Jesus Christ, your Son. Now we thank you, God our Father, for your bountiful love and care that gives and gives as we don't deserve and that takes us frail sinners and gives us life and promises to make even the least of us as a fruitful vine blossoming and bearing fruit for the glory of Jesus all through this world and all through eternity in the world to come. How we marvel, Lord, at your daring at your audacity, that you choose to confound the wisdom of this world, that you choose to disarm the authorities and the powers in the heavenly realms by displaying your power, your mighty power and wisdom, displaying it to the heavens and to the earth, through this marvelous redemption of saving a people for your name, of bringing to birth a church to be like a jewel reflecting the light of your glory to all heaven and earth for eternity. We marvel, Lord, that you should use even frail creatures such as we are to be the recipients of such grace, such mercy, and for such a purpose of great glory. And so, Lord, we beseech you to keep this household, your church, to keep us in continual godliness, that through your protection we may be free from all adversities, and that we may be devoutly given to serve you in works of goodness and mercy, to the glory of your great name all the days of our lives. And so this we ask in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Well, let me welcome you very warmly to our service here at the Tron this morning. Uh, if you're visiting us for the first time, then you're very particularly welcome, whether you're upstairs here and uh, I can see you, or whether you're downstairs in one of the rooms there in the overflows. We're very delighted to see you with us, and uh, we hope we'll have an opportunity at the end of the service to greet you. Uh, if you're able to join with us again this evening, we meet at 6.30 and uh, gather again around God's Word. We'll be continuing our studies this evening in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and we'd love to see you then, but uh, we're very glad, as always, to greet all visitors in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the name of his fellowship here. We very much hope that you'll feel uh, at home among us. I have uh, one or two notices to draw to your attention. I think you have these sheets on your, uh, on your seats, and uh, there are a whole host of things there. I want to pick out two or three just for your attention, particularly this week although they are all important and uh, I encourage you to read them all. 
But uh, you'll see in the middle portion there, on Tuesday this week, our new Christianity Explored course begins at 7.30 here uh, in the church building. And um, that is a course which is particularly designed for those who just want to find out more about what the Christian message is really all about. It's an eight-week course. We take you through uh, Mark's Gospel, the shortest of the four Gospels, and uh, it's an opportunity for you to examine the primary evidence about the words and the works uh, of the one that we call the Lord Jesus Christ. You have an opportunity to ask any questions you like, to probe, and uh, to really pull apart the evidence so that you yourself can be convinced of the message it is that we are uh, preaching. It's a great course. Uh, everyone who comes to do it uh, enjoys it. Some people come very hostile at first. Some have come determined to prove that uh, this is all a lot of nonsense. Uh, and if that's what you feel, that's all right. Come along and uh, do your best. Uh, we'll welcome you. Others come because uh, perhaps they've slipped away from church over the years and uh, want a refresher as to what it is that uh, the church is really all about. Whatever your situation, this is a course uh, that is for you, and uh, we'd love to see you along on Tuesday evening. So do come along, and uh, for the rest of us, do be praying for all that will go on here on Tuesday evening. Then uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see Friday and Saturday this coming week uh, is uh, a special weekend. Our young folk are away on their youth weekend away, so do be praying for them and all of their leaders that uh, they'll travel safely and that they will have a time of real uh, enjoyment and fellowship and learning. You'll see also that uh, we have our marriage seminar on this weekend, Friday evening and Saturday. Uh, many of you have already signed up for that. It's not too late to do so. We'd love you to come along. You don't have to be married, uh, but it certainly is particularly encouraged for married couples in the congregation of all ages and stages. We'd love to see you there, and I think we can guarantee you a very happy and uh, a good evening and day on Saturday and plenty of laughs to go alongside it. So we'd love to see you along at that. And, um, well, if your kids are away for the youth weekend, you'll be feeling ebullient and joyful anyway. So come along and uh, learn about uh, the side of marriage that doesn't necessarily mean looking after your um, teenage kids. Number three there, down and under Nota Bene, you'll see date for your diary. Please do note that our congregational meeting on the 6th of November uh, we have a number of important things to discuss and to share with you there about the future of the congregation, about further uh, development work and so on. And we're also going to have a report from uh, our team that were in Zambia during the summer. So we'd love uh, everyone to make that a real priority. And uh, we'll be here on Wednesday the 7th. So please uh, keep that date free. See, Tron Times is also out today and you can pick up your copy uh, after the service and we'd encourage you to do that. Finally, just to say that uh, this afternoon at uh, quarter to five, uh, I'll be taking a new members class. A number of you already signed up wanting to come along and find out about that. It's not too late if you want to know what it means to be a member of our congregation here and what uh, the purpose of uh, joining as a member is, then uh, today's the day to come along and find out, and I'll be very happy to share that with you, and I hope to see uh, a good number of you uh, this afternoon at 4.45. Well, I'll, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices. Do, do take note of them and uh, act accordingly and uh, uh, use these also to help your prayers as we pray together as a fellowship for all the things that we're doing uh, over this next little while. But uh, we're going to turn to our Bibles now for our first reading today, and uh, you'll find it in the Old Testament in the prophet Isaiah. We're going to be looking this morning at chapter 27, but uh, reading first of all in Isaiah chapter 5. If you have one of the church Bibles, that's page 569. This is the passage that Rupert was preaching on last week about the Lord's vineyard. So we're going to read Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, and then we'll come back later and read chapter 27. The Lord says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it, and cleared it of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. 
but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I'll tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Amen. May God bless this, his word. We're going to sing again, number 426. Number 426, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Number 426. Let's turn to our Bibles again, to Isaiah chapter 27, that's uh, page 587 if you have our uh, church Bibles. And we pick up 
the story of uh, God's vineyard once again. This time Isaiah looking to the future and to the promise of what God will at last do in the great day, the day of the Lord. And Isaiah says in chapter 27, verse 1, In that day the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeting serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it, I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle. I would march against them. I would burn them up together. Well, let them hold, lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob shall take root. Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. He has struck them. Sorry, has he struck them as he struck those who struck them? Or have they been slain as their slayers were slain? Measure by measure, by exile, you contend with them. He removed them with his fierce breath in the day of the east wind. Therefore by this the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for. This will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altars like chalk stones crushed to pieces, no asherim or incense altars will remain standing. For the fortified city is solitary, the habitation deserted and forsaken like the wilderness. There the calf grazes, there it lies down and strips its branches. When its boughs are dry, they are broken. Women come and make a fire of them. For this is a people without discernment. Therefore he who made them will not have compassion on them. He who formed them will show them no favor. In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain, and you will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown, and those who are lost in the land of Assyria, and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Amen. May God bless to us this His Word. Well, as we have a few moments of quiet now, and as the musicians play, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received.
Let's pray together. Gracious God and Father, as we bring these offerings before you, we ask that you would take them and use them, even as you take our lives and use them for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We long, O Lord, for the glory of our Lord to fill this earth as the waters cover the sea. And as we read these words from the prophet Isaiah of the great promise of the worldwide fruitfulness of your people in these latter days, how our hearts are filled with hope and with gladness, even in the face of the darkness and the tragedy, and the warfare and the turmoil that so fills our lives in this world today. But we know that there is a hope. We know that that hope will never fall to the ground, but that every word, every promise from the lips of the God whom we trust will be fulfilled and will be made glorious in our sight through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we think of this world that you have placed us in to bear witness to your glory. We pray, Lord, for places where there is great suffering due to man's inhumanity to man. We think of the war-torn parts of the Middle East, so often in our news these days, the land of Syria. We pray, Father, for continuing efforts to bring peace to that land. We pray for the surrounding nations of Iran, of Iraq. We think of the turmoil and the political changes in Egypt. We think, Lord, of a whole region that is in many ways so fragile and never very far from the outbreak of possible war. We pray, Heavenly Father, in our ignorance, and in our often naivety. We pray to the one who sees all things, who knows all things, and who is powerful to bring all things under your feet. And so we ask, Lord, for mercy for those who are driven from their homes as refugees, for those who are bereaved of loved ones, husbands, wives, children, fathers, mothers. We pray, Lord, for those who seek to bring succor and help to all who suffer. Above all, Lord, we pray for our own brothers and sisters in the household of our Lord Jesus Christ, the many Christian believers who in all of these turmoils and warfares are very often so greatly affected and so greatly persecuted by every side. We think, Lord, of other parts of the world where Christian believers are facing real violence and threats. Remembering our dear friends in Pakistan and those who have been involved with the recent bombings and killings in Peshawar. We thank you, Lord, for our brother Imran and his wife Nagina and all of the work that they do with Operation Mercy. We pray, Lord, for them as they seek to minister to those who have been recently traumatized by that atrocity of the bombing of All Saints Church. We ask that through them your light would shine and your love would be made manifest in real and tangible ways. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the many whom we love and with whom we partner in the gospel, who are seeking to bring the light of our Lord Jesus Christ to lands where it is difficult to do so by law, where there are many headwinds and many dangers and many struggles. Think of those working in Southeast Asia and different countries and pray, Heavenly Father, for your blessings upon them. We think of our dear brothers and sisters, Nock and Scott Murray and their family. And we thank you, Lord, for this gift that we will, as a congregation, be able to send to them as a result of our harvest offering. 
Now we pray, Lord, that these monies will encourage them in their work and gladden their hearts as a reminder of the fellowship that they have with us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that they will be able to use it to replace some of the equipment lost in the recent river flood and that through it many more will be helped bodily by Scott's medical and surgical interventions but above all Lord by coming to that Christian hospital where the name of Christ is proclaimed every day that they would hear of the one who is able to save them to the uttermost and to save them forever and ever. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our church in this land, in days when it seems that there is a gathering tide of momentum of those who would seek to suppress the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, especially for those who seek to minister to the children and the young people of our nation in the schools, in many opportunities that are given for churches and chaplains and workers from Scripture Union and other organizations to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ with young people. We think of this latest onslaught by the National Secular Society, seeking to do all to try and prevent people sharing the message of Jesus with school children as though this were some kind of child abuse. Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation where we can think that it is the right thing to teach our children about perverted sexuality but prevent them from hearing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. And give wisdom and sanity to our counsellors and lawmakers and those who have the power over these things. Give them wisdom, Lord, to see that all such influences to prevent the gospel of Christ, to prevent the teaching of the ways of righteousness to our young people and to others in our society, that all such attempts to destroy these things will only further destroy the very foundations of the freedoms that we have come so to cherish over the centuries in this our nation. Open blind eyes, Lord, we pray. And give your people who long to share the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ with all whom they love, young and old. Give them courage. Give them strength. Give us wisdom, Lord, to know how to behave rightly, to make wise judgments and not foolish, to commend the name of Christ by the way we behave and the way we talk, not to give any foothold to those who would seek to extinguish the light of your gospel in all aspects of our national life. We confess, Heavenly Father, that as your church we have not always been wise, that as your people, we are full of faults. Often, perhaps, we have done things and said things which have hindered rather than furthered the cause of our Lord Jesus. Lord, we know our faults. We know we're far from perfect. We pray, therefore, for wisdom, for help, for strength, for guidance from your Holy Spirit, that from us, Lord, the light of your truth would shine brightly and beautifully to those with whom we seek to share this greatest of every treasure. Help us to be a people who not only proclaim the truth, but who commend it in our lives and in all that we are and do. Save us, Lord, from ourselves. Forgive us our follies. Protect us and protect your glorious gospel, we pray, from the weaknesses of your people. And so, Lord, because we know we need your strengthening, because we know we need your wisdom and your light, we come today to your word. We ask that you would open our hearts to you, that you would open your word to our hearts this morning. Feed us, we pray. Humbly enable us 
to be taught, to be rebuked, to be challenged, but also to be comforted and encouraged and strengthened and given joy in our hearts that we might go from this place this morning ready to serve you gladly and joyfully in every walk of life in this coming week. Send us out, we pray, Lord, full of your light and your truth. And so, as we draw near to you now in faith, we ask that you would draw near and open your word for us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Rupert comes to preach to us then, we're going to sing once again number 850, number 850, Take My Life. And let it be all you purpose, Lord, for me. Consecrate my fleeting days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Number 850. Well, this morning we're finishing our tale of two vineyards with chapter 27 of Isaiah. So perhaps you turn with me back to page 587. And we'll ask for our Father's help. Heavenly Father, as we open your word together now, we pray that you 
would open our hearts and sharpen our consciences to your spirit. Help us, Lord, to humbly accept what you have to say to us this morning and to bow the knee to your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, how badly might you be prepared to be hurt for the sake of love? How much pain would you be willing to inflict on somebody because you care for them? Last week, Isaiah rather brutally lulled us in by singing what he purported to be a love song. And yet, no sooner had he won over the rather cold hearts of his listeners than he transformed his song into a horrifying tragedy. So perhaps now, when 22 chapters deeper into his book, we find ourselves once again listening to a beautiful song about God's vineyard, we'd be wise to be on our guards. This time, though, there's no mention of the word love at all. It's as if at the start of us to the Lord himself just bursts into song. And yet, without using the word even once, it soon becomes clear that love is precisely what this song is all about. Which, given that it's being sung to exactly the same loveless people as the last song, is surprising enough in itself. But what's even more surprising is the kind of love God reveals. There's nothing naive or sugary about it. There's a wild fierceness to God's love in this song. It's fierce both in its intensity and in its jealous determination to possess and protect his people exclusively. Chapter 5 looked like a love song, but it didn't much feel like it once Isaiah had flicked his knife. Lots of chapter 27, in contrast, doesn't look much like a love song at all, because God's love doesn't always look quite how we'd imagine. But a love song is precisely what we're going to find. One which will ask how far God is willing to go to bend our hearts back to him. Now, there's one thing we need to notice about this song before we dive in. Although it's being sung in the grim darkness of Isaiah's day, its subject is a beautiful future hope. So bracketing this chapter, opening the first two verses and the last two, is the little phrase, in that day, four times. Chapter 27 closes a short section sometimes called Isaiah's Apocalypse, which looks forward not just to the end of Israel's exile, but to the day God returns to make an end of all things. So that day is the day described back in chapter 24 when the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed. It's the day of chapter 25 when God will swallow up death forever and wipe away every tear. And it's the day of chapter 26 when God's truly repentant people will at last seek him again, when the dead will wake up and sing for joy. Now that day was still a long way off for Isaiah's listeners, but they needed to hear about it because right now, God's vineyard was in the terrible state we left it in last week. It was a broken society, a nation which had squandered their extraordinary privileges of grace and was beginning to reap the consequences. Which brings us to verse 1. Because right now, as Isaiah spoke, there was no doubt whatsoever whose influence was writ large over God's vineyard. It had the marks of the twisting serpent all over it. Leviathan there is the hideous, coiling predator who stalks the Psalms. It's a poetic picture of everything in this world which is sinister and demonic and standing in opposition to God's loving purposes. 
So in that day, before God's vineyard can be restored, his great enemy had to be destroyed. If his vineyard is to have any hope, then one day the creator will have to yield his sword. And in that day, verse 2, there really will be something to sing about. Well, the song itself splits into two halves, both of which tell us something about God's fierce love for his people. Firstly, and at long last, we find out about the future God has for his vineyard. And it's a future God is ferociously pursuing for them. Verses 2 to 6 tell us about the fierce determination of God's love. In that day, verse 2, a pleasant vineyard. Sing of it. This is the song God can't wait to sing. Of the day when all of that painstaking care he's lavished on his people will finally reward him. The song he'll sing when he looks at us, his people, and says, at long last, here is a vintage worth waiting for. Well, as in chapter 5, he sings about the loving attention he'll pour into his vineyard, but this time his song is a complete reversal of the judgment he meted out back then. Chapter 5 was a song about the people who had spat in the face of God's grace. And so God had withdrawn precisely the privileges which they had scorned. But listen now to how that's all reversed. Back then he withdrew his gracious provision, stopping the clouds from raining. But now, verse 3, I, the Lord, am its keeper every moment. I water it myself. Back then, he removed his gracious protection, breaking down the walls which kept us safe from harm. Now, though, lest anyone punish it, verse 3, I keep watch over it night and day. Back then, he was burning with angry indignation at his callous, ungrateful people. But now, verse 4, God sings what must surely be four of the most reassuring words in the Bible. I have no wrath. It's a verse just full, says Calvin, of wonderful comfort. For it expresses the incredible warmth of love which God has for his people. And incredible seems to me the right word, because remember who Isaiah is addressing this to. If there was one thing he wanted us to feel sure of, as we read his first song, it's that wrath was precisely what they deserved. Judge for yourself, he said. Remember that? And yet, says Isaiah, to those same callous people, there will come a day when God will look at his vineyard and know that his anger is spent. Those four words are going to come at quite a cost to Israel. More on that later in the song. But they would come at a far greater cost to God himself. Next, there's what comes from being right with God. Back in chapter 5, his special people returned to the lost state of the rest of mankind. The vineyard would be overrun with thorns and briars, a throwback to God's original judgment in Genesis 3. Life under his care with its little respite from man's curse would be taken away. But now, verse 4, There's not a thistle in sight. If you want a taste of the fierceness of God's love, then you get it here. He talks like a lover just bursting to show off his protective passion. He's simply looking for a chance to defend his beloved. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle, I would march against them. But even if there were any enemies left, 
well, before they could get to his people, they'd have to face the same warrior who took down Leviathan. Or, verse 5, they can do the sensible thing. They can sue him for his peace. And like his church, like his vineyard, they can lay hold of his protection in Christ. I, for one, would rather know his fierce love than his sword. And there's one final part to this great reversal, possibly the most important at all. Not only will his wrath be spent, not only will they know him once more as protector and provider and constant gardener, but they themselves will be changed. At long last, verse 6, the vineyard will be what it was made to be. Something which brings delight and joy to the Lord Jesus. In days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Chapter 5 was a song about what God had made his people and what they refused to be. This is a song about what God will make of his people. At long last, Israel will be what they were called to be, a blessing to all the families of the earth. That last vineyard was itself overrun with weeds, but this one will overrun the world with the fruit that brings glory to Christ. The last vineyard produced stinking, sour fruit, a society which the pagan world would only look at in absolute revulsion. But this one will produce lives which taste so sweet that the world will want what they have. And there's our strongest clue that in some sense, at least, the day God is singing about has already begun. The gospel has come to you, Paul told the Colossians, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing. This great reversal began the day that Christ appeared to crush the head of the serpent. And just as he warned, the vineyard was taken away from those who rejected him, and hand it over to others, so that until he returns, us Gentiles too are invited to lay hold of his protection and begin producing fruit, fruit which one day will fill the world as every tribe and tongue and nation comes to this vineyard, to Jerusalem, and bows to its king. That, in God's love, is what he is fiercely determined to make of his people. And it's a wonderfully encouraging picture, isn't it? But why does Isaiah want to show it to this lot? I suppose we have to ask whether they, or we for that matter, long to sing this song in quite the same way God does. Isaiah is writing to a people far more like that rotten, rebellious vineyard of chapter 5. But he wants them to know what they were made to be, what God is determined to make of them. My older daughter took absolutely forever to learn how to walk, partly because she was an expert bottom shuffler. She got so good at dragging herself around on her bum that it was as if she just couldn't see why she'd ever need her legs. And like most paranoid parents, there were moments when I had visions of giving her away in marriage, all decked out as a beautiful woman, and having to wait while she shuffles down the aisle on her backside. But eventually, of course, like everybody else, she discovered that God had made her to walk. The perversity of chapter 5 was that despite all that God had given her, Israel persisted in being something so much less than they were made to be. Well, isn't it encouraging, after being bruised by that 
tragic song last week to see that God intends better for his people. Shouldn't Judah have longed for the day when God could say, there is no wrath left? Shouldn't we long for the day that we're fully and wonderfully possessed by the fierce love of our maker and to delight him with that cherished, beautiful vintage which he's waited for so long and so patiently. That's the goal God is ferociously bent on for his people. Verses 1 to 6 show us the fierce, unrelenting determination of real love. But when love is real, it means doing what's best for somebody, even if it causes them real hurt. Which is why the second half of the chapter also has to tell us about the fierce discipline of God's love. You see, God's fierce discipline serves his fierce love. And if verses 1 to 6 showed us the goal God has for his vineyard, then verses 7 to 11 show us the means by which he'll get them there. Leviathan isn't the only problem, is it? It's us that spoils the vineyard too. Heaven won't be heaven if you and I are the same as we are right now. So verse 7 jolts our gaze abruptly off the not yet and back into the present to the trouble and pain ahead of Judah. Because before they could be restored, the vineyard had to be torn down just as chapter 5 warned. But this second song adds something seriously important to how we understand God's judgment. When he's dealing with his people, even when they deserve it as little as that rotten vineyard, God's purposes in judgment are always good. Now, it's a little tricky at first to hear how he's saying that in verse 7 because of the way the poetry itself grabs our ears. There's a pounding rhythm to the verse, almost as if we're listening in to the blows of war taking place. But just listen carefully as I read it again to the question he's actually asking. Has he struck them as he struck those who struck them? Or have they been slain as their slayers were slain? The question is, did God give his people what they deserved? Has he struck them as hard as he struck the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the other nations? And the answer we're clearly meant to give is no. There's a reason, isn't there, that you've never met a Moabite. It's that they were wiped out of history. They got what they deserved. And chapter 5 told us that's precisely what should have happened to Jerusalem. Yet, even in his anger, God treats his people better than they deserve. It's the principle Christians call grace. And that is surely something we ought to be immeasurably grateful for as we read these two songs. It tells us that the difference between us and the people on the street outside is not how well we've responded to God's privileges, but how extraordinarily patient he's been with us. And the only possible excuse for such manifest injustice on God's part would be that one day, in his grace, he would provide a substitute to be struck and slain in his people's place. Now that is not to say that God's discipline wasn't severe. The picture in verse 10 is about as harsh as it gets without blotting a people out forever. The city, presumably that's Jerusalem, but it's been a recurring picture through these last few chapters of man's 
proud, God-defying self-reliance, that city will be left for cattle and firewood. His people with such little spiritual discernment, verse 11, that they betrayed the God who made them. He'll show them no favor. And yet, while God judges his enemies, verse 8 says that he contends with his vineyard. That's a legal word. It implies that he's wrestling with them in court, holding them to their covenant obligations. And he'll do that for Judah, verse 8, through warfare and exile. Yes, it is certainly a severe mercy. But nevertheless, that God disciplines his people rather than destroying them is a mercy we should never forget. Notice Isaiah tells us two things about it. It's restrained, verse 7, and it's restorative, verses 8 and 9. It's not as bad as they deserved, and it's meant to lead them to repentance. William Still said this, The difference is as stark as between heaven and hell. In fact, that is the whole difference, because while God's chastisements point to heaven, his judgments point to hell. The fierce discipline of God's love is how he'll bring about the great goal of his love. And that's explained in verse 9, isn't it? By this, through this severe mercy, Jacob's guilt will be atoned for. It's not saying there that by suffering enough punishment, they made up for their sin. He's already said they didn't pay what they deserved. But atonement was made because through God's discipline, His people were made to see their guilt and turn back to him. And the evidence, the full fruit of that repentance, is what the second half of verse 9 shows us. The idols Israel cherished so much, all those things she put in place of God for her security and self-esteem, well, she would crush them like chalk. God's fierce discipline would teach her to trust him. God's punishments, says Calvin, atone for our offenses indirectly because they lead us to repentance. And repentance, in turn, brings us to forgiveness. Now, I wonder if you ask the average superficial modern evangelical, what God's love means to them. How many of us would answer that it scares us a little? I doubt very many. But I have to say, after living with this passage for a week, God's love scares me. Not because I doubt it, but because I can believe it a little bit more. What God is doing in this age with the people he loves is not simply keeping them warm and tucking them up at night and whispering sweet nothings. He's forging their souls. He's doing whatever it takes to ensure they produce fruit for his vineyard. And if our salvation is a sure and certain thing in Christ, which it is, then the fierce discipline of God's love must be just as sure and certain because it's the one which ensures the other. We can get there kicking and screaming or we can get there joyfully but he won't let us in with divided hearts. His love is too jealous for that. Now let me be clear that Often, when the Bible talks about God disciplining his children, it means the training we face just by living in a world which hates Christ. The Hebrews faced those sorts of trials, didn't they? So they were reassured that God disciplines his sons. It isn't always because of something we've done. We don't 
always needs to go searching for sin when bad things happen. But Isaiah is writing this to a people who've insisted on doing things the hard way. Insisted to the point where, to quote Mr. Still again, God in his love has to thrash the sin out of them. Often we can be just like my daughter, can't we? We can insist on shuffling around on our backsides and refuse to simply get up and walk and be the people God redeemed us to be. And if we believe that God's love is a fierce love, then we should expect him to respond sometimes by making life a little bit harder. There came a time when I had to stop handing things to my daughter when they were well within her reach, if she'd only get up and use her feet. Surely all of us have known times when a particular struggle just seems to consume you. Internet pornography is the classic example, isn't it? But it could well be less colourful. And the more you give in, the worse it gets until it seems that your whole spiritual life is falling apart. You lose discipline in other areas of your life. You stop reading your Bible. Your work might even begin to suffer. And just perhaps the Lord in his severe mercy is teaching you the hard way to crush an altar which, if you're honest, you've begun to enjoy far more than you're enjoying him. Friends, when we slip in that way, we had better believe that our Father is able to make life harder and more painful than it needs to be. Don't be like a mule, says Psalm 32, that needs to be curbed with a bit stuck in its mouth. And don't doubt, says Isaiah, that God's love is far too fierce just to smile on us all the way to hell. Well, as he closes, Isaiah brings us back to that glorious goal which God's love in all its ferocity is bent on pursuing for his people. In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, from pole to pole, God will thresh out the grain and one by one he will glean his people from the chaff. Not a single person who belonged to Christ would be lost in the exile. Not a single one of us here who loves the Lord Jesus will fall under his condemnation, even if that takes God threshing and beating us into his heaven. In that day, says Jesus, he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call to gather his elect. And that's the closing picture in verse 13. It's borrowed from the year of Jubilee in Leviticus, where every 50 years, God's people would rest and remember the great goal of his determined love. And on the Day of Atonement, a trumpet would sound proclaiming liberty to the slaves and telling those in debt that they were allowed home. And one day, says Isaiah, the trumpet will summon us home from our exile, home to worship the God of our salvation. Well, that's the tale of Isaiah's second vineyard. I suppose we could sum the whole story up like this. It began with the serpent God's sword must slay if his people are to be free. And it ends with the slaves God will summon home to worship. And in between, we heard the song God can't wait to sing and the severe mercy God in his love cannot spare us. Loving determination and loving discipline. Christ will have fruit from his church. Every fiber of his fierce love is bent towards that goal. 
What a terrifying love that is to stand in the way of. And what a wonderfully reassuring thing it is to know that a God who loves like this takes such determined joy in us. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you have sworn to possess and perfect the church you redeemed by your Son. Thank you for the fierce, unrelenting determination of your love for us in Christ. Help us, Lord, more and more to produce beautiful gospel fruit which delights and honors the Lord Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. Well, as we close, we're going to sing of God's wonderful grace, which gives more than we deserve, number 752, wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve. Let's pray as we stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatness and the depth of your great love for us, a love that is willing to wound that it might heal, but a love that promises glory and will not fall short ever of that great glory that is promised. So, Lord, may we take that word And take it to heart this day and this week. And to that end, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.